That's right. So this is Python profiling and performance elementary to enterprise. So we're going to be covering uh, like from little intro stuff uh, and all the way to enterprise level stuff. And uh, so my name is Mahmoud. I'm lead developer at PayPal Python infrastructure. We do a lot of enterprise stuff. Uh, I've been doing Python since about 2009. Before that, I did PHP and Java. Um, I've built services at PayPal that take between 10 requests a day and uh, a billion requests a day, and uh, all in Python. Uh, and so Python can scale. I'm here to tell you how we did it and how you might do it too. So uh, I enjoy uh, open source Python, reading Wikipedia, and also occupying PayPal OCCU.py. Uh, it's the best Python program. And uh, yeah, you can follow me at, at mhashemi and github.com forward slash Mahmoud. Okay. So Python profiling and performance. It is the engineer's delight and or doom. It is, uh, it's a tough topic, and it's also like sort of the fun stuff as well. Uh, today we're going to be covering the different types of performance, uh, some ground rules for uh, tuning code. Uh, then we're going to talk about profiling and measurement. And finally, we'll get into the scaling strategies that we've used. Uh, it's going to be uh, kind of a packed talk. It's going to be very tight. So I'm going to have to go fast. I'm going to talk fast. And questions, uh, we'll probably have to wait to the end. Got to go fast. All right, here we go. So let's start with some definitions. What is fast? Uh, so in terms of enterprise uh, software, we think of three measures. When someone says, oh, I want to make my software fast, I have to ask, number one, is it uh, latency or throughput or efficiency that you're most interested in? So first of all, latency, this is frequently what people associate with a site feeling fast, you know? The time it takes for a response uh, to occur. When you press on the gas pedal, does the car push forward, you know? Um, and so we say like a 200 millisecond client round trip. That is like you know, a reasonable way to describe fast in terms of certain uh, seconds latency. So OK. Uh, then we have throughput. That's like successful traffic flow. Uh, that's how many uh, successful transactions or requests are moving through the system. So 200 requests per second. You know, that's kind of like, you know, that's decent. That's respectable for enterprise software. Uh, and finally, we have efficiency. And this one can be very important for uh, if you have kind of a low margin business, uh, like a gaming company or maybe uh, like you know, stock trading or something like that. You really care about utilization and your return on investment. This one's kind of nuanced. You, know, you say something like, we can support 2,000 users per four core VM. You, know, you get kind of specific with what you want. And this is really important. When you are making fast software, you have to really nail down what the re requirement is. You have to establish an SLA, as we call it, uh, in the enterprise world. So uh, now that we have these definitions, we can move on into uh, the fact that scalability is not a way to define performance in any way whatsoever. It's not a type of performance. It's complex, and it involves a lot more than just scaling uh, your latency, throughput, or efficiency. It's about scaling people. Enterprise software is very frequently about you know, factoring code so it can be owned by different people. Reliability matters. Scalability is very nuanced. And so if something's scalable, it's not necessarily performance. That's important. All right. So let's set some ground rules for performance. Safety first. You got to wear your seat belt, your helmet. You got to check your mirrors. You know, if you're going to jump in the F1 car and go fast, right, you have to take these precautions. So uh, number one, uh, predictability is power. Number two, good work takes cycles. Good work takes time. You know, when your boss wants something done in a day, you say, look, do you want it good or do you want it fast? You know? And uh, we all want good first. Uh, and third, uh, we have to abide by Amdahl's law. And so uh, how many here have heard of Amdahl's law? OK, so yeah, we're going we're gonna to be informing some of you, I see. All right. Number one, predictability is power. Uh, this is really good news for Python developers, right? Because we have uh, great tools for this. You have to establish what correct behavior is and write tests to code that actually does that before you can start optimizing. Write your tests before you write your benchmarks. If it, do, you don't want, like, it doesn't help anyone if you're making mistakes very quickly. You know, it's about successful traffic. So uh, yeah, and then it's important to test after every optimization because optimized code is harder to write, harder to read, it's less maintainable, and it's buggier and more brittle. You know? So basically, you're going to need those tests to make sure you don't have regressions as you go through. 
Um, and yeah, like I said, we're in great luck, not just because we have t uh, tools like Tox and PyTest and so forth, but also because CPython uh, is an amazingly consistent interpreter. Unlike uh, the JVM or something like that, it has very fast startup time. Uh, and uh, there's no JIT, no warm up. The first request is often handled as fast as the last request. So you can, uh, it gives you a lot more profiling uh, tools, as we'll see. Uh, there's no complex GC, it just sort of works. That's one thing that we sort of take for granted in the Python community. Number two, good work takes cycles. Healthy enterprise applications have big bones. You know, you have a lot of instrumentation. You know, it's a, it's a very, like, you know, robust uh, application. Uh, so you have to gather your requirements around security, instrumentation, and compatibility. These things will slow you down, but very frequently if you don't have them, then your application is not viable enterprise software. So, uh, yeah, like I said, you want to establish SLAs around 50th percentile, 95th percentile, 99th percentile. 99.9th percentile, 99.99th percentile, that long tail does matter. You want to track that max time and you want to make sure that you're pushing that down. Um, you want, then you want to just stick to your budget and put down the ping pong paddles. I don't care about like ping pong, micro benchmarks, right? An echo server, how fast does it go? That doesn't usually end up mattering in the end. If it doesn't have a database in the flow, if it doesn't have downstream services, if it's not doing some piece of hard work, then it's never going to appear in production. So production software uh, has budgets and not micro benchmarks. And Alex had a very good point. Alex Martelli gave a talk right before lunch. Uh, you know, good enough is good enough. And Python is emperor of good enough, right? We are good enough in a bunch of different domains and we should really leverage that. Finally, number three, uh, our buddy Amdahl. So Amdahl is a, a person, uh, and he has a law, uh, or had maybe. But the law stands, even if he doesn't. Uh, basically, speed ups are relative to task significance. Um, this is basically a programmer way of saying, like, you know, you got to keep perspective on things. Uh, if you look at this uh, diagram here, right, you have to focus on one part at a time. Like I said, with optimization, you often end up changing one thing at a time. If you look at the original process, process A takes much longer than process B. If I make B five times faster, it doesn't really, you know, shorten up the whole process as much as if you made A two times faster. So in service-oriented applications, and this enterprise software very frequently is service-oriented, uh, the hard things are very frequently, uh, as far as CPU-bound things, you have uh, cryptography, serialization, and um, let's see, compression. Those are the things that are gonna eat up your CPU. And so, uh, you know, those are the things that we very frequently end up optimizing to make very fast code at PayPal. All right, so to recap, predictability is power. You want tests, you have CPython. Uh, good work takes cycles. Make sure you have the right, uh, like, you know, instrumentation and so forth in place. You don't wanna be flying blind in production. And uh, finally, abide by Omdahl's law. Okay. Now that we have the ground rules set and you're wearing your seatbelt, we can get into the actual optimization. Optimization always begins with profiling tools. I've separated these into three categories. There's casual profiling, offline profiling, and online profiling. Um, so let's get going with the most casual, friendly one that everyone loves. Print-based debugging will never die. You're always gonna have some time where you import time and then you, you know, it's start equals time dot time. You do your stuff and then you subtract the current time from that start time and that's how long your thing took. This is a type of profiling. This is measurement. This is better than just guessing. But it's not as good uh, as it could be because single measurement could mi misrepresent how this would take in production, how long this would take in production. Measurement expense could ex exceed the operation, uh, and you have to switch to different timing mechanisms on different platforms, and it can get tedious. So Raymond Hedinger and Core Python devs made a nice tool called Timeit, and Timeit will run multiple times. Uh, and it does it like thousands, millions of times. And it's really great for these like small things. If you're wondering if the dict constructor is faster than the dict constant, you can answer that. Um, it disables garbage collection. It does a lot of things that sort of let you get a very consistent measurement from micro benchmarking, like certain small pieces of Python code. And it has two convenient ways to run it, either from the command line, which is my favorite. You do python -m time it -s, that's your setup code, like importing modules. Then you give it the code to do. It takes 1.73 microseconds per loop to dump an empty uh, dictionary to JSON. You know? And you do this enough times just to satisfy your curiosity, and you start to develop a muscle memory around what takes how long in Python. So with a little bit of experience, you'll get the hang of it. You can also do it programmatically. I give another example of doing exactly what the command line interface does on one line of Python. 
Jupyter Notebook has built-in support for this, percent sign, percent sign, time it. And there's also a successor to this being written by another uh, core developer called Perf. And that one uses a little bit more fancy statistics and so forth. Talk to me about statistics after if you're interested. Next up, uh, we have offline profiling. So that was casual uh, profiling. Here we're doing serious offline profiling. And here Python has another great tool that's built in called C profile. Um, so those simpler tools are great for smaller things when you know what you want to measure. But when you have a whole application and you're wondering what is taking all the time, don't guess and test little things and time it. Run a profiler, and C profile will give you per function statistics on how long things take. It's a little bit hard to read. It's a little bit uh, utilitarian in its output. But once you learn to read it, it's right there built in, and you can run it very, very almost casually. But uh, however, it does sort of slow things down. Uh, I see my code ran off the screen a little bit. I'll fix that when the slides go up. Uh, but yeah, you can run it at the command line, python mc profile target code. And then maybe that just works and you just get some like, you know, really good stats. Try it out on like a command line tool or something like that. You'll see that it works pretty well. Now, uh, there's a lot of advanced places you can go beyond C profile for offline Python profiling. Um, like I said, C profile gives you per function stats. There's another thing called line profile, which or line profiler, which uh, basically it's not built in, but for a particular function, when you're wondering what takes so long, it goes line by line, and it tells you like this line is the one that's taking a long time, and that really builds that muscle memory for how like how much takes how long. That's basically like time it on every single line, uh, and then uh, you have yep. That one crosses the Python C boundary, so C profile is written in C. However, it only uh, you know, tests Python code. And if you're wondering what's taking so long in those extension modules and in other areas, then you have uh, yep. Uh, finally, concurrency can uh, really mess with your uh, profiling. So if you use Greenlit like we do at PayPal, then there's Greenlit Profiler, and there are also other profilers for other types of concurrency too. Then there's memory profiling if you care about how big your processes are getting. Importantly, all these tools are built with things that are built into Python. So there are a lot of tools that Python has in the runtime. It's a very rich runtime. It has those nice big enterprise bones, and that's why we like it so much. So, um, however, one thing about offline profiling, it slows down your application. You can't run it in production. For that, we have online profiling. That's something that you leave on in production. And what it does is it's a, basically a thread that's running. And every 10 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, whatever, it wakes up, and it takes a snapshot of what is happening at that time. And now, you're going to have to let your application run for a while, but after a while, you get a representative view of what your application is doing in production, and uh, you know it's not really slowing down your application. So we run this uh, in production and so forth, and um, we ours is called Sampro because it's like professional. Like Kurt named it. Uh, <laughs> my things are all named after rocks, which is obviously better, uh, and so it's called Lithoxel, and it gives you the semantic instrumentation that we can leave in production. It gives us timings that we then push to logging upstreams, and we collect with statistics daemons and so forth. Uh, both of those are open source, so uh, Lithoxel, L-I-T-H-O-X-Y-L. I give a lightning talk. People seem to like it a lot. Finally, uh, we're getting into like the real heavy bit, and this is where we're going to have to speed it up. Uh, the eightfold way to scale, to scale software in the enterprise. I think this basically covers all of it. This is a taxonomy. It's a model. There are other ways to scale, maybe, but if you, I don't think so. So, like, you know, if you find one, let me know. All right. So let's get let's get started. Number one, you add more hardware. This may sound like cheating, right? But if you're able to just add some machines and your site scales in a way, that's the ideal. Right? That's your linear scaling. That's you're just getting your you know, established ROI and you just keep growing, adding more hardware. You can, it works for PayPal, it could work for you. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, but unfortunately it has some like, pros and cons and that's how all these slides are gonna be. So it only solves certain problems. Uh, you know, provisioning and deployment things have to scale at that point because you have more and more machines and there are great talks about that here. Uh, and finally, there are budget limits. Not everyone is as uh, you know, lucrative as PayPal, so uh, I can't like, buy uh, 10,000 machines. But uh, yeah, so my uh, list of Wikipedia runs on one machine, by the way. But, uh, so, but the good is that it does solve certain problems. It's easy to explain. Everyone here gets it, right? You buy a computer, you all have computers. You get it. Um, and it's the essence of scalability. Number two, you re-architect to divide work. And this is where a lot of enterprise software it just sort of gets stuck. Basically, you go around, you start factoring things into services and microservices, and you start figuring out how to have things like scale in different ways on different machines. And uh, yeah, it's really easy to get mired in. But uh, so it's easy to mess up. 
uh, you know, like you sacrifice short-term correctness uh, and long-term extensibility. Uh, and also, you can easily generate, like, people talk about now you have two problems. Here you have, like, n to the two problems. You have n squared problems when you start factoring things out. But the good is that uh, a lot of people are getting pretty comfortable with it. People know what microservices are. Everyone knows about services. And, uh, you know, there are many SOA technologies to guide you along this way. Number three, you adopt the asynchronous approach. And this is one that is getting a lot of attention now in Python because they're adding it built into the language uh, in Python 3. Um, so the bad of this, uh, so in one important thing to realize in scaling is that you have uh, CPU-bound tasks and I.O.-bound tasks, things where you're waiting on other services, like your database, to do its work uh, versus things that you are working on yourself. So if you're encrypting a big file that's eating up your CPU, you're going to see 100%, and it's doing its best, right? But oftentimes, you'll see that an application is slow, but you're still at 0% CPU. So uh, what's happening there? Oftentimes, you're I.O.-bound or lock-bound as well. Um, so you can sort of start to solve those I.O. bound problems and s handling lots of connections, ingoing and outgoing, by adopting the asynchronous approach. Uh, the bad of this is that it drastically changes your application. Just because it's built into Python doesn't mean that like all Python programs are going to immediately work with it. Um, it takes a really different mindset to work with concurrent systems, and you want to make sure you have good tools. Python has a lot. so. Uh, but regardless, you're going to complicate your, your code, especially debugging and profiling, and uh, it limits what libraries you can use. Uh, the good is that many libraries exist, and it's a great way to learn about systems. You know, I did not know about async and concurrency before I started working at PayPal. You know, I knew about that threads were a thing, but I really did not know much beyond that. So uh, yeah, basically what I'd recommend here is make sure you need it. It works for us, but I'd be lying if I didn't say that it takes a significant overhead, and you want to have a support team like who can guide you through that. Um, still, it's good for learning. All right. Uh, strategy number four is to use a smarter algorithm. So this is the ideal way to reduce work and those, in those CPU-bound scenarios. If you know your big O notation, if you can find something that's like, you know, uh, log time versus quadratic time, you're going to be able to speed things up. And so, you know, you go on Wikipedia, and you learn about some things, and you advance as an engineer uh, and a computer scientist, and uh, you uh, can make your code faster. Um, it's great for interviews if it doesn't work, you know? So, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, there are a lot of built-in examples that, uh, in the library, in the Python standard library that use this approach. So uh, some maybe lesser known modules are like the bisect module, which does binary search, the heap queue module, which does heaps. Those are nice, like, you know, sort of data structures that work on top of Python's very fast list uh, data structure. Uh, either tools, you know, have some smart algorithms in it, and RE is actually quite fast. It compiles down to its own language and, uh, you know, has its own little state, ma state machine like VM inside of Python. Okay, so even uh, naive implementations can be made a lot smarter with caching, sort of the dynamic programming type stuff. So if you add a cache, that's like a smarter algorithm, and that's sort of like lumped in with this approach. Now we get into uh, scaling strategy number five, which is the first Python specific. Scaling strategy, all those previous things, adding more hardware, for instance, right? You can do that with any stack. So even if you don't just do Python, you have that decision tree available to you. Now we're going to get into uh, Python-specific stuff. So we're going to write faster Python. Here we make small gains, but they sort of do add up. And we, like you know, like we said, we build that muscle memory with time it and so forth, and then we're able to uh, move on into making our applications very fast. Um, you can't really parallelize a lot for uh, you know Gil and obvious reasons, uh, but the code can uh, you know also get less clear. Typical of optimized code. Good news is that your packaging deployments stay the same. You don't need to worry about like you know building new libraries, um, and uh, it's easy to measure and iterate. And the built-ins are very fast. The dictionary. Very fast. List, very fast. Python string handling, very fast. You know, I'm proud of Python, even though I didn't really do much on top of that stuff. Okay, so uh, yeah, it's low risk, but it can be high reward once you like sort of stack those up. Next, you can build a Python native extension. So Python's close relationship to C is one of its greatest strengths. Over many, many years, C Python is easily, in my opinion, one of the best reference implementations of a language. And it served us very well. A lot of big sites, YouTube and Dropbox and so forth, use it. And they scale to very large degrees. Um, but a lot of that is enabled by using uh, extension modules and the C Python interpreter. So the bad of this is that if you start dipping into that, C has riskier bugs. A seg fault is much worse than a, you know, actually getting a stack trace that Python VM gives you. Um, and it can complicate your build and deployment. Uh, so you have to know what GCC is and 
you know, you have to get on with life, I guess. Uh, so uh, the good is that you get, like C has two to 10 times less overhead. It integrates with a big open source uh, C ecosystem. So OpenSSL, that's like C, and it's the fast like thing that you use for cryptography. And it's the, also the secure thing that you use for cryptography. At least we're all in the boat together when we say that. And um, <laughs> then uh, C Python is clean and idiomatic C, so you can learn some good C. So, uh, and like, you know, but these days, if I'm being honest, PayPal uses a lot of Cython for these core crypto operations. And that's how we get uh, these, well, I think we have one component now that basically ha does like 200 microsecond response times. You know, and so that deep sub millisecond is reachable using C and Cython, but primarily a Python code base. Okay. Uh, number seven. Uh, is you can use a faster implementation of a given library. And so uh, the bad of this is that the availability and maturity of these libraries is sort of like, you know, questionable sometimes. Um, you have to worry about the architectural compatibility with your concurrency model, and uh, they're going to be built in deployment constraints. The good of this is that, like, you know, Python does have standards. PEP8 has made a lot of libraries very easy to read. Um, often it just works, and it can be drop-in. So the examples I give that are built-in are there's C, C elementary implemented in C versus elementary, right? And externally, right, UJSON is much faster than the built-in JSON for certain JSON messages. Uh, plus, there's all the stuff based on NumPy, and Python is amazing because we have all these different groups uh, working in all these different fields. And our stack is based on GEvent, which would not have been possible without Linden Labs making EventLit uh, for Second Life, a gaming-like thing. And that wouldn't have been possible without GreenLit, which comes from EVE Online, which uh, uses Stackless. And so that's Python as well, back in the 90s. And uh, so thanks to gaming companies, PayPal has very efficient services in Python. Uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, so, so we get a lot of really, really good cross-pollination from these better implementations from companies who have different utilization constraints. Remember, going back to the thing, we have latency, throughput, and utilization. Gaming companies don't make a lot for every, like, you know, ship that you destroy, <laughs> you know? Um, and so uh, their profit margins ends, and we're able to sort of pass those savings things on to you, is what I tell my boss. Okay, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all right. Um, and finally, this is a really good one that's coming up and up more. Uh, we have multiple runtimes in CPython, I or in Python. So I talk about CPython a lot, but Python has different implementations. So there's PyPy and, Jy and Jython. And um, originally when I wrote this, I was like, well, my, my philosophy was like, well, you just sort of try it out, and if it's faster, good good for you. Like, it just works or doesn't work. You have tests. I told you to write tests, right, before your benchmarks. And so, uh, you know, it does drastically change your deployment. And, uh, you know, you have other limits as well. And basically, big code needs probably some rework. But we did write a thing that basically takes a gigantic syslog pipe, like, t like tens of thousands of syslog messages arriving per second uh, to one machine. And our CPython was sort of falling behind on it. And we threw it on PyPy. It's a single module. It's a very small service. Uh, and then it's, ten, it's like five times faster. So it, uh, you know, if your code is small enough, it can really work. And um, it can also lead to some interesting blog posts and so forth, because the PyPy community would love to hear about success stories. So uh, yes, thank you, Armin Rigo and team for PyPy. OK. Uh, yeah, so let's do a quick recap. So, uh, so far, we uh, basically defined what performant is, latency and throughput and utilization. Uh, and then uh, we talked about how to stay safe. You define some tests, and you worry about Amdahl and his law. And then uh, we, you measure with profiling tools, which are online, offline, and casual, time.time. .time. And uh, I also taught you how, how to scale eight ways from Sunday, because it is Sunday. And so just remember, there are no silver bullets. No language is going to bail you out of a performance issue. Uh, you know, you need to measure, and then you can optimize, and you will perform. So thanks. <laughs> so uh, I'm taking questions, and you can call out from wherever, and then I'll just repeat your question. Yes, please. Yes. Sure. Uh, 
So the question was, is uh, using specialized hardware and uh, specialized external services a class of optimization? I think so, but I sort of, I can lump it in. I can rationalize pretty well. Uh, but uh, <laughs> one of the benefits of being an engineer. But what I'd say is that like, uh, that is a very important point. Python has like scientific computing. They use CUDA, and you can get things running on graphics cards. And I think that we acquired a startup at one point at PayPal that used Python with that stuff to basically do um, character recognition of credit cards. So you could take a picture of a credit card, and it would like sort of enter it for you. And that was using machine learning from the scientific community on uh, the, those like graphics uh, cards and so forth. And it worked great. And I don't think very, very many other languages could do that. So that's that's a great point. Yes. More questions? Yes, please. Uh, sure. So there was a talk about uh, Python's memory uh, layout earlier uh, in PyBay. Um, honestly, we haven't run into a lot of memory issues because uh, Python. So PayPal is a polyglot uh, environment, and that means that Java is there, <laughs> and Java is basically setting the bar. And uh, we can we can run many many workers within the space that Java wants to have for its VM. It's a very it's a very important point. So the question was, how do you reduce the memory footprint uh, with Python? And um, one great thing I like about Python is there's a module called GC. GC stands for Garbage Collector, and you can basically go ask that module, give me a reference to every object in the system that's GC tracked, and you can just scan over it like a Python list. Just put a list comprehension and look at every object in the system. And it's very, very convenient for finding where you have memory leaks and reducing your memory footprint. Um, well, yeah, so, uh, and yeah, we stay slim in that way too. More questions, please. Yes? Absolutely. So the, so the question was, uh, do we basically add tests that make sure that we stay within a good baseline for certain performance critical areas? And the answer is absolutely we do. Uh, you know, we have, uh, increasingly we're using PyTest these days, but we do have a legacy uh, test runner, and we've just hard-coded values that are influenced by baselines we've collected from production. So uh, we use a microtransactional logging framework that, uh, called Lithoxel, and uh, that basically gives you timings uh, on a lot of semantic activities, and we take those times from production, uh, and we get like a nice regression test, and we like sort of run it through, make sure everything's good, and uh, we stick that in the test so that our continuous integration will fail if uh, we regress, if somebody basically accidentally makes like too many copies of a list or something like that. So that's a very good point. That's a very good practice. I saw a question over here, yeah. Yeah, so uh, using the GC module, probably, right, there's another uh, library called uh, ObjGraph, uh, like object graph, and that one's pretty useful. There's the memory profiler I mentioned as well, and uh, we even have an object browser, like a web browser for your objects, uh, yeah, that basically lives within a, any given process, and that is our ObjGraph, and it just uses the GC module, no special C required or Cython required. Well. You all have been great, and uh, thank you so much. I've been Mahmoud. Here are my links. Here's my bull being, uh, you know, accosted by pythons. Uh, that's what I think of bull. Anyways, uh, yeah. So I encourage you to go forth and make performant applications uh, in the enterprise and elsewhere. Thank you.